We've been in this relationship series for, this is the fourth week now, and uh, last week, Pastor Irene Rollins was here uh, with us talking about, shame. talking about shame. It was so, so powerful. If you're with us for the first time, you can catch up by just going to, again, podcast or YouTube or what have you, and you can hear all the messages, because I think this has been very, very impactful and has been pushing all of us forward. Uh, so today, we're going to continue on that finale. journey. This is the finale of the yeah. relationship series. But but it continues on the podcast. That's true. It does. So, uh, like I said, we'll have that going out every single week with so much love, you know. Uh, John, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn there? Luke chapter 19. We're going to start reading in verse number one. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to put the words on the screen so you can follow along with us. So everybody at home, everybody in additional seating, here we go. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse number one. Jesus entered Jericho. And was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now we're going to find out some things about this man named Zacchaeus. Number one, he was a chief tax collector. Number two, he was wealthy. Number three, we're going to find out that he wanted to see who Jesus was. He's interested in Jesus. Number four, we find out he couldn't see who Jesus was because he was short. So this is where the Bible's just savage sometimes. It's just like short. Not that there's anything wrong with being short. So here we have these four things about this guy, Zacchaeus. He's a chief tax collector. Is he poor or wealthy? He's wealthy. That's right. Uh, we find out he's interested in Jesus, but he can't see Jesus, not only just because he's short, but it's because the crowd is in his way. I wondered about us. Are we in the way of some people who are trying to see Jesus? I, I'm praying that us as a church, I, I'm praying that all of us in our posting and in our behavior, in our language, we're not creating blocks for people to see Jesus, but instead we're paving roads for people to see Jesus. I, I pray that if there are people wealthy, short, tall, poor, wherever they may be from, I pray wherever they are around the world that we as a family, as a church, as a community are not blocking the view of Jesus. But when people are trying to get to Jesus, we say, hey, we'll do all we can to help you see our glorious Savior. But in this story right here, this wealthy man, this leader in the community, he can't see Jesus because of the crowd. So please think about what you post. Please think about how you live. Please think about how we treat each other in relationships. Because some, I'm praying even for our, our kids. Right now, things are going good, right? We got, things are going good with our kids. I mean, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of runway still, so we're praying that it ends that way. But right now, things are going well. But our kids... Our marriage is not getting in the way of them seeing Jesus. And for some of us, our parents' marriage got in the way of us seeing Jesus. How can God be good if you treat mom like that? How can Jesus be loving if you treat dad like that? Now, God in his grace is able to work through all of that, and that's why some of y'all are even present today. Thank God for his grace that he keeps on pursuing us. But we're trying to live lives and have a relationship that help people see Jesus, not block people from seeing Jesus. So this rich man does something crazy. Look at verse number four. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now watch this. Verse number seven. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Here are the trolls. They're even back in Jesus' day. Here they all start posting. You can't go to that house. You can't sit with those people. You can't be with him. I ask the question, how in the world is the darkness supposed to know about the light if the light never goes into the darkness? 
How in the world are people who don't know who Jesus is supposed to find out who Jesus is if people who know who Jesus is never talk to people who don't know who Jesus is? But, but it's interesting that once you go ahead and sit with someone, all of a sudden everybody wants to start jumping on, posting, and saying what they want to say about where you should go and where you shouldn't go. And the same thing happens to Jesus here. He enters into this man's house. He's going to sit with this chief tax collector. He's going to sit with this wealthy man, and everyone starts telling him why he shouldn't and why he shouldn't be wearing that and why he shouldn't be going there. And what does that mean? And are you going over there? Or don't you know you're validating their life? And little do they know, Jesus is not going there to validate this man's behavior. He's going there to see a transformation take place in this man's life. But there's going to be no transformation if there's no conversation. So he goes in. And we don't know what's said. We don't know. But we know Zacchaeus' response. Because between verses 7 and 8, something crazy happens. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. We don't hear the conversation. We just know that they're sitting at some table having some conversation and when everybody out there is muttering and complaining and shaming Jesus this man Zacchaeus is having a transformation from the inside out one that impacts him in such a way that it makes its way all the way to how he handles his money honey when we were reading this this morning it was reminding me of my story of my verse seven and eight and I think about when I was in college and there was a coworker, I was Zacchaeus, and there was a coworker who helped me get to Jesus. And technically, she probably, I wasn't a, a peer of hers. I didn't live a lifestyle the way that she lived her lifestyle. I wasn't in church. I was, I was just a hot mess. But she invited me to her table, even though I was different from her, even though my life was different from hers, and she saw something in me. Even though I was a hot mess, she would take me out to lunch. She would take me out to coffee, and we would hang out. She would hear my story. I wonder if Jesus and Zacchaeus did the same thing, and she didn't judge me. She didn't shame me. She didn't force me to think how she thinked. She just loved me. And it was through that love that finally I said, I'm going to come to church with you. And then it was through that love that I was able to see that God had a plan for my life. I was able to see that I no longer needed to settle in relationships. I was able to see that there was no ceiling on me, that I had capacity, that I had a, that I had a season of poor relationship after poor relationship after poor relationship. And it was because she invited me to her table and because I just did life with her that I was able to see her example and I was able to see that there was a spot for me at the table even while I was still trying to understand. And I think sometimes we dismiss people because they're not where we think they should be. But really, it was conversation after conversation, laugh, joke, going to the movies, going to dinner, that over time, I saw something that I wanted. I saw the light that was on the inside of her. But if I was never invited to her table because my light wasn't bright yet, I might not have even been able to see the light. Does that make sense? And I wouldn't even be, be married to you right you now. Have Cause I'm not marrying a hot mess. Let me just tell you that right now. I'm not marrying a hot mess. But you kind of did. <laughs> yeah, so I'm verse 7 and 8. Yeah. I feel like real time, I was verse 7 and 8. Yeah. You, you know, you know me today, but you don't know me when I was, um, had a very poor self-image. You didn't know me when I was in unhealthy relationship after unhealthy relationship. You didn't know me when I didn't know that God had a plan for yeah. my life. They don't know you when you were wearing all the crop tops. They don't know me when I was wearing all the crop tops. <laughs> And Throwing drop. back 40s. Not kidding. Not kidding, y'all. Okay, for, for those of you that know what a 40 is, do y'all oh, know what a 40 is? Honey, it's this church real... knows what a 40 is. Let me just tell you that right now. Okay? Yeah. You don't have to explain that to the bulk of our church, which is one of the things I love about y'all. <laughs> yeah. Some of you got your brown paper bag with you right now, and you're welcome here. You are welcome. <laughs> yeah, but verse 7 and 8. 
But there's a, a lot change. can happen. Yes, but a we have to give people a chance mm -hmm. to get to verse 7 and 8. Yes. I think sometimes we don't even invite someone to the table until they get to verse 8. Wow. But the beauty for my life was transformed in verse 7 through 8, just Man, like Zacchaeus. That's so, so good. So then we see that Jesus does not get off of his mission, even with the trolls. Jesus said to him in verse number 9, Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Today, the title of uh, our message here, this talk, this moment, is a different way. Because we feel like there is a way, but the way of Jesus is a different way. And we're trying to paint a picture for all of our relationships that we can do it a different way. You see Jesus here going about it a different way. We see him sharing the message of who he is a different way. He went into places that people didn't think he should go into. He went a different way. And in a day and age when everybody else is trying to spew hate and shame and point fingers, I'm just letting you know we're going a different way. We're going the Jesus way. We're going to go to tables, have conversations. To wrestle about the hard things and believe that God in the midst of it all will transform hearts from the inside out. But since we've been talking about a different way, we thought we wanted to bring up a, a couple of individuals that can help us uh, discover and, and uh, explore this different way. First and foremost, I want to bring up Daniel and Ashley Poku yes. right here. We love y'all. Daniel and Ashley, for those of you who don't know, Love you. are a beautiful couple, as you can see. Yep, he's pulling out the chair. Well Good done, job. Daniel. <laughs> uh, Daniel was a part of our church when there was 20 people in it. If that. If, if that, that. If that. Over uh, 10 years ago. We have seen him grow and mature yeah. into an amazing man of God. Ashley, we met three, four years, four four years, four years ago. ago. Four years ago now. And we have seen what God has done in our life. It's been absolutely beautiful. But we talked for a, what, a couple of weeks a couple ago. A couple weeks ago about a different way of dating. Because we're going to hit on today, you know, marriage, relationships, leading businesses, how to handle converse, tough conversations with peers. And so we're going to start this conversation off with how to date a different way. So they met and fell in love at Shoreline City in a connect group. In a connect Shout group. Out Shout out to connect group. Go to connect group, y'all. Yes. <laughs> But a couple of weeks ago, we talked about dating a different way, that we don't have to date the way that we see people date constantly, heartbreak after heartbreak. There's a way that you can date this God honoring. Yeah. And I remember saying during our message, if you don't believe me, we're going to interview some couples that have decided to date a different way so that we can learn and yeah. see examples of healthy dating. Because we talked about, hey, sex is reserved for marriage. Mm. And the room, y'all got quiet. <laughs> Online, I know you were quiet too. You're like, close that computer. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a different way. Yeah. There's a way that Jesus is calling us to. Yeah. And Daniel and Ashley, they live this different way. So would you guys be willing just to share with us a little sure. bit of your story? We're honored to even be up here. And Seriously. I first have to start and thank our pastors mm -hmm. who went before us, right? There are people that I'm looking their notes yeah. for how I'm doing relationships and they're literally sitting to my left okay so um, I'd like to just start by saying that the ways that Pastor Earl, Onika, Ron Brown, Judy the way that these individuals kind of helped us understand um, dating yep. was they helped us understand the end goal which is marriage you date with the intent to marry right mm -hmm. but what's the purpose of marriage for the Christian the purpose of marriage is to honor God, okay? Mm -hmm. So if that's the purpose of marriage, you ought to date with some intention mm -hmm. of that being the goal in mind, okay? Yeah. So one of the things that you can immediately throw out, which is hard, right, is try it before you buy it. What does that concept have to do with that end goal of honoring God? What does that have to do with it? What does the way I honor with my language have to do with honoring God? There's absolutely relevance for that. What does my humility and my capacity to sacrifice and, ser what, and serve, what does that have to do? Mm -hmm. There's a direct relationship with that in terms of how you honor God. So um, for me, the high level, it was if I can honor God better with this incredible girl, I'm a keeper. 
He did. <laughs> Shoot, she kept you, man. She was to the curve. I know, she kept I, me. I should have yep. said that differently. We she know how me. this works. I got the ring, but she kept me. So she, she, she put it on. Aww. No, I love it. And I just think back to us dating, and we talk about the context of saving sex for marriage, y'all. And we dated for almost three years until we were married, right? And so it is possible to save sex for marriage. And I will tell you guys this. Our emotional and our spiritual connection was so much stronger going into our marriage because we saved the physical component for marriage. So when we were dating, we were forced to have the vulnerable conversations. Absolutely. We were forced to lean into one another because we couldn't solve our problems with physical intimacy. And so when marriage came and it's now time for physical intimacy, I feel so much safer in this relationship because I know my heart is safe with him already, wow. right? Oh because he, so pro good. he proved so that in dating. So good. In God's infinite wisdom, right? In the principles of how we're, like, that's supposed to be saved for my wife, mm -hmm. right? Sex. Those physical blessings are supposed to be saved for marriage. It's as if God totally knew, guys, that the one thing that could get in the way of the other components of our intimacy and our connection, right? Spiritual, emotional, physical. It's as if he knew the physical could stand in the way of the other ways you can connect yeah. and be yeah. connected. So if you jump into that, start kissing, start making out, and you know go the go that route of going the impure way of dating, you actually can stand in the way of connecting with your person spiritually and emotionally. Because all you're waiting for is what's going to happen at the end of the night. I remember being in those moments where I was like, I can't wait to make out with this girl. <laughs> And all of the conversations about her mom and all the things we need to be praying yeah, for yeah. became distractions and just things in the way. Yeah. How terrible is that? How terrible is that? That's right. That's right. Crazy. And, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes, you know, we're having this conversation. It doesn't mean that in previous relationships they did it this way. Right. If right. this was a relationship, they decided we want to do this so a God-honoring way. We want to honor one another. And Ashley, can you speak to Absolutely. a little bit to, like, before Poku mm -hmm. and all the things that you talked about? Yes. Yeah, so I never dated right before I started dating him. Um, and so before I actually started dating him, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship. And so I was bringing that baggage into the relationship. And it was actually Judy Brown who told me, hey, you guys are going to talk about this. You're going to talk about these things, these triggers, these things you're walking through. And physical intimacy for me actually made me feel dirty because it was something that was forced in my previous relationship, right? And so I was looking at him and I was like, there's no way this man who loves the Lord, is on fire for the Lord, is leading his life so pure, could ever possibly love me. And so I just want to encourage all of the ladies out there that your shame, your past, you might feel dirty. That is not the truth at all. You are a daughter of Christ and you are renewed and you are whole. And so I want you to know that your worth and value is in Christ. And I even say it to him all the time. I'm like, he's just a glimmer, a little glimmer of how much Christ actually loves me. And so I needed to accept that love for myself from Jesus. So there's two things. It was, one, I'm going to surrender my shame. I'm going to surrender the past. And I'm going to lean in and accept what God says about me. And I'm going to be open and vulnerable in this relationship so we can move forward. So, so powerful. Can you guys share with us some of the practical pieces? Because you might be thinking, that sounds impossible. Yeah. Like, how can you honor God physically in a relationship? So would you give us some practical handles? Because I can tell the room's like, wait, you did it three years? Yeah. Wait, you didn't sleep together for three years? It was years? hard. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely, sure. definitely, yeah. But so practically, number one, yeah. why, did you, <laughs> why did you make that decision? And then um, some practical handles. And are you glad that you decided not to do that till you got married? Yeah. For sure. I mean, I think we got enough wisdom about it being better if you stayed pure. That was kind of the reason why it honored God. Um, practically, uh, we had mentors that we said, we're gonna, first of all, we asked them. So definitely ask people to mentor you and come alongside you. Sure. And we gave them permission 
to ask us questions, right? Being transparent without any accountability mm -hmm. and vice versa doesn't work. So if you're going to ask somebody to be in your life, let them know everything. Yeah. Let them know what you struggle with. I let them know, like, here are my tendencies with porn. Most guys in here, even women as well, will say they struggle with porn. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand because everybody would, yeah. bottom line. Yeah. So you need these people who will know what's going on. Practically, if we're traveling, which we tried to do a little bit because of the temptation, if we're traveling together for a wedding, we would tell this couple what our arrangements are. We'd actually text them the minute we are going to bed and wow. let them know that In we are not rooms. together. Separate <laughs> hotel right. rooms, yes. So that was practically how we did that. But we also did something that was more... Uh, mechanically mm -hmm. in our dating day to day, week to week. So yes, tell so we that. started honoring each other when he would come over to my apartment or I would go over to his apartment for a date night because I lived by myself while we were dating. And so it was the practical of he would look me in the eye and be like, here's how I'm going to honor you tonight. And it was wow. the practical of me looking him in the eye and being like, here's how I'm going to honor you tonight. And it was all the things like, I'm not going to touch here. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And it was that moment where we were like, man, we're not going to look at each other and say we're going to do these things and then lie to each other by doing those things later uh, on sure. in the evening. So if you're in the audience, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is so extra. How are they doing? Like that boundary came about because uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> we were struggling. OK, yeah. that came about because of those things. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was very, very effective to look this woman in the eye that I intended to marry and tell her with my own mouth, here's what I'm gonna do, and have to go back on that, yeah. because I dishonored what I told her. I, I cornered myself, mm -hmm. I cornered us, to make what we're saying our integrity, we put that on the line. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to trust me, I wanna be able to lead you. So if I, if, if I can't tell you and follow through, how can I ever lead you? cornered myself and I think we have to do that sometimes man it's so so powerful to hear how you're sharing and what you're sharing is absolutely amazing I've seen and it's new it's new for it's new for many people yep. it's really new but something that helped us in our dating relationship because similar to Ashley I, I have a crazy story um, I think we all do um, but I just remember that dating Earl helped us both learn self-control mm. Because just because just because you get married doesn't mean you no longer have temptation. Yep. And so because we practice self-control while dating, I believe that it gave us self-control for when we are apart, so when we right. are traveling separate now that we're married, because there's always someone more beautiful, with more muscles, with a better... Whoa, whoa, there's not someone more beautiful. <laughs> whoa, 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 honey, honey. They're just... This is getting kind of personal. <laughs> what? Why did you emphasize muscles? <laughs> you have great muscles, babe. You, that's not convincing. <laughs> all that to say... This is all about Michael B. Jordan once again. It all comes back around to Michael He's B. He's going through a tough Jordan. time, so... He is. Yeah, but what does that have to do with his muscles? <laughs> Anyways, I'm saying that... Why not learn self-control while you're dating yeah. so that when you're apart, when you have that boss or that coworker or that work trip, it's not the first time you had to practice not doing what you want to do, you know? And I think that it brings healthy security and confidence when you teach each other not to move on every impulse. Yeah. I believe that it brings security for the future of a relationship yeah, because so you don't know if you don't practice it. Yeah, so, so yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have Daniel and Ashley. Yeah living a different way. Thank you guys yes. for the way you surrender. Thank you for sharing with us today too. And we go love back you. and listen to our message from a couple weeks ago where we talk about how to honor God in dating relationships in yep. 2022. It can be done. It can be done. And they love each other. You see the way they look at each other and how, I mean, it works. It makes you, it makes you appreciate the other it person does. more. It really, really yeah. does. Uh, we want to bring up some other individuals here, and this is Jordan and Raymond Moriello. Uh, this might, couple might be new for some of y'all, uh, but Jordan and Raymond were a part of the church. They were like the second or third couple yes. to say yes. Over 10 years ago. want to be a part of planning this church. They were with us from the very, We met on the dance beginning. floor, true story. Yes, true, met and at a wedding. And we were all dancing together, and I thought, you know what? 
They are good. <laughs> I could do life with them. <laughs> and they have some beautiful children uh, that we love a ton. Been married for so many years. Uh, author, business owner. It's just been amazing what God has done in their life. Uh, but we're going to talk about something that could take the air out of the room for a second. So let me just give you fair warning. But we're talking about a different way. Because with all that's going on in our world today, we have to understand how to handle conflict a different way, how to handle marriage a different way, yeah. how to handle leading a business a different way, how to handle offense a different way. And uh, Rayma uh, got offended and almost left this church, Shoreline City. And you're here in a moment, some of the things that she walked through and even some of the collateral damage of walking through that season of offense. But we, we want to live a different way. So we're glad uh, we are where we are now. But let's talk a little bit about where we were all those years ago. Yeah, so um, this is actually, I was on staff when this happened. So kind of removed from your mind that it doesn't happen to leaders or it doesn't happen to people on staff like it happened um to me and like they said we were two of the first people to join this um church but i at the time we were in leadership and i stopped checking my heart i allowed pride to get in and i stopped caring about the ones walking through the doors, I started focusing more on like, where was I sitting? Was I being applauded? Did everybody recognize me? You know, it became about me and my heart began to drift. And because it was already drifting, because there was already, you know, a wedge in there, something small and really petty happened and I got my feelings hurt and I got offended. And instead of saying something, I kept it inside and I used the mask of, oh, I'm gonna pray about it. I'm gonna just let it go. I'm gonna, you know, and, and I didn't let it go, you know, and they had no idea that I was offended or hurt because I'd show up on Sunday and I'd say the things and I'd smile and I'd love and thinking about myself because it was about me, but they had no idea that I was upset because I had past church hurt. So I projected onto them that if I came to them with um, how I was hurt, that they would reject me that they wouldn't love me anymore, that they wouldn't trust me anymore. And um, so I kept it inside. And where things went really sideways, though, is instead of going to them like I should have, I went to everybody else. I started talking to my peers. I started talking to the people that I had been entrusted to lead about my offense about how I was hurt. I even, you know, would vent to my husband about how I was hurt. And obviously they're only getting my side of the story. They still have no idea what's going on because all of these conversations are happening behind closed doors. And it's heartbreaking to say though, because I was more concerned about making an ally. I wanted people on my side. I wanted people to hear my side. I wanted, I wanted to feel validated in my offense, um, there are some people that actually left the church because of my hurt that they owned as their hurt. And, you know, that's heartbreaking because I believe that they're still supposed to be here, but because of my undealt with offense, they left. And I am thankful, though, for having somebody in my world <laughs> that had a different perspective than I did. Yeah, you know, it, when you see stuff like this and you look at it, you're, you're like, well, offense, well, that doesn't happen in church, Certain, certainly not with staff. And, and in the Christian walk, we shouldn't be dealing with this kind of stuff. And, and let me tell you guys, it's just flat out untrue. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter yeah. of when. Mm -hmm. I mean, guys, like, mm -hmm. Jesus was crucified because he offended the religious leaders at the time. He was betrayed by wow. Judas because Jesus, Judas was offended yeah. wow. with Jesus, right? Yeah. If offense happened to him, 
it's going to happen to us. And it's the same plan that the enemy has been using since he put offense between Cain and Abel. It's the same thing he uses against us as he tries to use offense to bring division and disunity. And, and, and I reflect on this time in our life, and there's three things that I felt like I really learned about what the enemy does with defense. That if we know these things, I think it helps yeah. us understand that and even stand in those times. And that he uses offense to bring certain things into our relationship. So he's going to distort, he's going to separate, and he's going to deflect. So he's going to use offense to distort the truth. Right? We knew that God had called us to Shoreline City. And then the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to question, has God really called us mm. to Shoreline City? Right? Am I going to stand on what God says, or am I going to be more worried about the fact that my wife is hurting? That's a real thing. I had to process yeah. that. But I also had to process that God said, you're here. And if we hadn't stayed planted here, if I hadn't stood on God's word, if I hadn't delighted myself in the word of the Lord and stayed like a tree planted by living water at Psalms 1, mm. right, then we would have not have borne some of the fruit that we've borne in our life. Some of the fruit for people that are here in this church now, too, where we have seen lives change. Right. Some of the prosperity mm. that has come in our life would not have happened if we were not here mm. planted, right? The other thing the enemy does is that he separates. Wow. He's, he's going to isolate you from people who are good influences in your life, godly influences in your life. Mm. And you're going to go to the people that are going to tell you what you want to hear. Mm. And let me tell you guys, when you have a, an offense yep. and you have a very strong opinion on something, going to only people that will tell you what you want to hear is not strength, that's weakness. Whoa. When your offense can't stand up to the light of other people's opinions about Ooh. it, it is not strength. Wow. Right? You need to be willing to have your offense challenged. You need to be willing to have your thoughts challenged, right? Or you will never come out of these seasons in your life. You have to have godly counsel, right? Yeah. Proverbs says that wisdom is found yeah. in the counsel of many. I'm very, very fortunate to have an incredible, godly, wise father. I was able to use him in this time to go to my dad and get counsel Man. and say, I, I, I need your opinion. I, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to respond wow. to these situations. So I went and sought counsel. I didn't let myself be separated. Right? But, but then the last thing, and this is probably going to be one of the biggest ones, is that um, it will deflect the responsibility mm -hmm. for unforgiveness. Wow. Right? It, it, this offense will tell you that it is the other person's responsibility to come get you to forgive them. Mm. Wow. It is not. That is not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us the exact opposite, that unforgiveness is our responsibility, wow. that we should be looking at what's in our own eye before we try to remove the splinter from our brother's eye, that yes. we should seek them out, that if you have a problem with a brother, you should go to them. And if you can't resolve it, then you get someone else and you go to them together. And if then you can't resolve it, then you go to the church. Woo. But you don't go Man. post passively aggressively about them on Twitter or Instagram. Or we don't go to the world and seek an echo chamber to support our Come views on, on things so that we feel better about holding this offense and we can justify it. Yeah. Because that's what the world is telling you to do. That's what the enemy is going to tell you to do with offense. Because if he can do that, then he can divide you. And if he can divide you, then he can conquer. Man. But if we're going to stand strong, you have to be willing to stand up to your own offense. It's going to happen. You're going to be offended, but you have to be willing to look these things in the eye to stare them down and say, no, I'm going to go a different way yeah. with my offense. Man, so powerful. So and I don't know if you guys, anybody who's gone through growth track, you serve on a team, you've maybe heard people say, I'm thankful for your yes. I'm thankful that you've said yes to serving on a team. And I think for this situation, I'm thankful for his no. I'm thankful that he was strong enough to say, we're not leaving. And um, walking me through um, forgiveness, walking me through having hard conversations, because he's better at confrontation than I am. I'll run. I want to run. I like um, run towards it. Oh, confrontation. Yeah, uh, <laughs> which makes heated conversations really tricky here. Um, but the turning point in all of this is... We had had many conversations after it came to light that there was something broken here, uh, that I was offended, that I had drifted. Um, we'd had multiple conversations that were very hard about my position on staff, and rightfully so. And um, I remember having a conversation with Pastor Earl, and this was probably going to be the last conversation that we had before I was going to be removed from staff. And 
I remember sitting there wanting so badly to have them apologize. Here, I'm sorry from them. And I heard God say, you need to repent. And that broke. I felt a heaviness break off of me in that moment. And I remember looking at Pastor Earl and saying, I need to apologize to you for not having guarded my heart. I need to apologize to you for um, not coming to you, not um, living by the 12 stones. I didn't protect unity. I caused division, and I hurt people, and I wasn't trustworthy with the people that you had me lead. Um, I had to apologize and repent to the other team members because me drifting, me not checking my heart actually caused a gap on the team. I actually hurt those people around me. I hurt the people I was le leading. I left a gap where I was supposed to be standing. And that's what offense did to me is it took me from my position that I was supposed to be in. And because I left my position, people suffered for that. And so... In James 5, it talks about going to one another and confessing your sins to one another and laying hands and praying with one another and that you would be healed. And so I had to be okay with having the hard conversations that made me uncomfortable. I had to repent, which was the opposite of what my pride wanted me to do. And then by doing so, we were able to pray and we were able to heal and there were steps that needed to be taken to um, regain trust. They didn't put me back in leadership. You know, there was a whole process to that. But had we left, had he not stood his ground, and had we not done what our flesh wanted to do, which was leave, some of the most devastating moments in our family, this church family was there for us. If we had left... We wouldn't have had community at our door, bringing us meals, crying with us, praying with us. And I'm so thankful that we did the hard work and that we went God's way of healing offense because I don't know where we would be. Uh, thank you both for your courage, your hearts, your leadership. Um, your love, your leaning, all of it, it means more than you can possibly imagine. And um, I will I, say that there yeah. is a different way to deal with offense. As you lead teams, as you lead your organizations, there's a different way to deal with offense. As you navigate your dating relationships, there's a different way to navigate offense. As you navigate marriage, there's a different way to navigate offense. As you are on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, there's a different way to navigate offense. And offense is trying to be on the altar of all of our lives in this season. But there's something disarming about sitting at a table. It's uncomfortable at times. It's awkward. It's painful. But on the other side of that table is restoration and healing and fruitfulness. And so sometimes before we do the post, maybe first we need to go to the table. Yeah. So, so good. Can you guys give it up for Jordan and Raymond right here, too? Man, guys, thank you. It takes a lot of courage to open up your heart, you know, like that. And, and it took us all forgiving one another. Oh, for yeah. sure, Yeah, man. we apologize, they apologize. Yeah, yep. And, um, but in that humility, that's where I feel like the fragrance of his presence was able to fill the room. That's exactly We wouldn't right. be at this moment had both of us apologized. The Bible says it really clear. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that might be the reason a lot of our relationships don't have the grace that they need. It's because there's not enough humility in the relationship. So some of us with husbands and wives, coworkers, friends, parents, siblings, we might need to have some conversations today. And we're just praying that the grace of God would fill and touch every single one of those hearts. I want to say one last thing, too, is sometimes we wait to understand before we apologize. But I wonder if we apologize first, 
if then it will soften our hearts to be able to understand. Man, that's so, so good. Why don't you do me a favor, church family, bow your heads for just a moment. An additional seating online. I ask you to bow your head just so that you can focus for just a second. Matter of fact, um, I just, I definitely sense the grace of God here to heal hearts online, an additional seating. I feel like some people have been wounded, have been hurt, but, um, but just need some fresh healing. And I just want to ask God's grace right now to fill and to touch and to minister hope to every single life. And I'm even going to actually invite Rama back up here. I, I want her to pray. You can keep your head bowed for just a moment. I just want her to pray over people's hearts and what some people might be going through and experiencing online, in the room. Let's go ahead and pray for people's hearts, Rama. Father, we thank you that you see the places that have been broken and fragmented, the places that are covered by shame, the decisions that we made that we regret, that we wish we could go back and undo and rewind the clock. Father, thank you that you are a God that covers it all. Father, we pray over every person who feels like you've abandoned them or if they've ran too far away that you're not going to reach them there. God, would you show them that you are present? Father, we pray that you would heal every broken situation. We ask that you would come in and heal broken relationships. Father, I pray that you would show us a new way. God, the ways that we've been going that have brought in and ushered in brokenness and dysfunction, would you show us another way? And Father, I pray right now that in this place there would just be a spirit of repentance. God, every place that we have allowed pride to take the throne of our heart, Father, we ask that you would give us a spirit of repentance. Father, every time you've told us to go straight and we didn't obey, Father, we repent. Everything that we've allowed to breed division in our lives, Father, we repent. Every time you wanted us to say, I love you, but we remain silent, Father, we repent. Every time we've done something to breed division or hate, God, we repent. Everything that we have not done that you have called us to do, God, we repent. And we ask that you would cleanse us and make us clean. Father, would you heal us from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet? Father, we ask that you would go uh, through the depths of our heart. And would you uproot every dysfunctional uh, seed that has been planted that's bearing toxic fruit in our lives. God, we ask that you would do a new thing in and through us. In this season, we refuse to go the world's way, but we say yes to God's way. Father, we are going to speak to mountains and believe that they're going to be moved. Father, we know that you put relationships together and we refuse to walk away from them. God, I pray against the spirit of quit right now in Jesus' name that we will be a people that stand and stay and believe the best and see with eyes of hope and speak to mountains. Father, we, um, we thank you that you didn't quit on us, that you went to the cross for us. You went to the place of death for us. So Father, may we not hold back everything that you've put inside of us to do. May our lives be a reflection of your glory, your grace to a very broken world. Would our unity be a reflection of your love for us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for that, Raymond.